Welcome to the Astrophysics Variety Hour. I'm Felicia Day, and now here's the show where I put the me in astronomy. Hello. That's not me. Hold on. There I am. Human, where did you come from? The same place we all came from, Dronebot. Interstellar gas and dust. Thank you. I did not actually mean. Before our solar system existed, before there was the Earth, the Sun, and all the other planets, there was a massive amount of interstellar gas and dust. Interstellar means the empty space between all the stars that make up a galaxy. Inter between stellar stars. All the gas and dust was just drifting and floating around out there. Eventually, gravity pulled a lot of this gas and dust together. The massive cloud got increasingly hotter and denser until finally the gas ignited and became a star, which we later named the sun. We have a call from a viewer. Hi, big fan. Are you saying that if enough gas gets together, it can ignite and shine like a star? You bet your sweet holographic projector I am. So if Dronebot releases enough gas, it can become a star. Possibly, but it would need to be a lot of gas, like hundreds of thousands of times the mass of the Earth. I don't think I have that much. Anyway, after the sun formed, there was still a lot of gas and dust left over in our solar system. A lot of that material formed everything else in the solar system, like planets, asteroids, and comets. We have another call. Hi, big fan. So the Earth is made out of the sun's leftover scraps? The Earth and everything on the Earth, including you and me. When I say we come from interstellar gas and dust, I meant that literally. Is this the only viewer watching right now? I am uncertain. It might seem strange to think that our entire solar system formed from a giant cloud of gas and dust. But it's not just us. Almost every star in the night sky is a distant sun, each formed out of drifting interstellar gas and dust. The phrase gas and dust has been said eight times. There are billions and billions of stars out there in our galaxy. And amazingly, scientists think that most of them have exoplanets orbiting around them. Hi, big fan. What's an exoplanet? It's just a planet that formed around a different star that's not our sun. Gotcha. One minute till the mime segment. So, let's review. The sun and the planets were formed by... Gas and dust. Nine times. That's right. And the stars are all basically other suns with their own planets called... Exoplanets. Because they're outside our solar system. Now, are most exoplanets awesome like the Earth or completely pointless like Neptune? Neptune is the worst. Well, some of the exoplanets may be a lot like the Earth or Neptune. But there's a lot more variety out there as well. Did you know that around one star, astronomers found a planet with non-stop planet-wide hurricane winds? Paging Dorothy Gale. 30 seconds. Oh, and that's not all. Imagine lava worlds, ocean worlds, planets orbiting two stars at the same time, and planets that are disintegrating while we're observing them. Oh, there's just so much out there we've only just begun to discover. This is why I like to say that exoplanets are exoplantastic. You never say that. That is cool. I see where you're coming from. It's the same place you come from. Interstellar, Interstellar gas, gas and dust. <laughs> <laughs> Ten times. And now it's time for the astrophysics mime. All stay in the same category for $50. What is the interstellar material that formed all of the stars, including our sun, the planets, and even people? Glue. Love. Oh, paper clips. Oh, sorry, we were looking for gas and dust. Interstellar gas and dust. Honestly, I'm having trouble understanding how you all ended up on an astronomy quiz show. Contestant number one, you have the board. Uh, I'll take that one. Looney Tunes for $10. That's not even what that says. Exoplanets, exoplanets, exoplanets. Exoplanet is just a name we use for planets that formed outside our solar system, orbiting stars that aren't our sun. I'll bet we found a lot of exoplanets. We found tons. 
There's a world with a huge ring system, over 200 times the size of Saturn's rings, planet J1407b. The B must stand for beautiful. Then there's 55 Cancri E. It's hot, really hot. Hot enough to melt rock right under your feet. I lava it. How about Trappist 1D? Astronomers think it might have a planet wide ocean. Who needs sandy beaches? They're always crowded anyway. And it's always hurricane season on HD 189733B. Prepare for non stop 6,000 mile per hour winds. I'm glad I brought a kite! There are already thousands of known exoplanets. Exoplanets! And scientists can learn something about planet formation with every new discovery. I can't wait to visit them! You can't! Space is really big, and human spaceships are really slow. It would take millions of years. I'll start saving now. Travel descriptions are extrapolated from conjectures based on current scientific understanding. Actual surface conditions may vary, are not guaranteed. This just in. Exoplanet WASP-69b is having its atmosphere blasted off into space. Jackie has the full story. Thanks, Don. Intense light and particles radiating from the surface of the planet's star are essentially blowing the atmosphere off of the planet. Astronomers call this stellar wind, but it's not like wind on Earth since there's no air in space. It's intense light and particles from the star. This sounds like some pretty intense wind, Jackie. Don't worry, Don. The planet's 163 light years away. That means it took 163 years for the light from this event to reach us so that we could know it happened. So this actually happened a long time ago. 163 years ago. Hmm. Which I guess means we're technically a little late reporting it. In other breaking news, dinosaurs are now extinct. That was great miming. Dronebot, how's it coming up here? I am adding more lights before the next segment. Great! We can't have a musical triangle battle if no one can see their instruments. Human, you said that people are made out of sun scraps. Gas and dust that was left over after the sun formed, yes. It does not make sense to me that people and planets and the sun all came from one big space cloud. Well, it does explain a lot of curious things. For example, we've long known that all the planets in our solar system orbit around the sun going the same direction. Have you ever wondered about that? I did not know that was true. And the planets are also almost on a flat plane instead of orbiting from all sorts of directions for the same reason. Imagine that there's a big cloud of gas and dust spinning and drifting through space. Eventually, gravity starts pulling all the material in on itself. It gets densely packed in the center and becomes a star. In our case, we call that star the sun. But there's still all the rest of the original dust rotating around the star. It starts to flatten out like a giant spinning pizza, and some bits stick together. The gravity of these clumps pulls in more gas and dust until some are planet-sized. Other clumps stay smaller, asteroid-sized. So, the small bits collect into bigger bits until you've got a lot of large objects with a huge amount of empty space between them. So, it all makes sense. Everything came from that one original cloud of dust that flattened out. It's mostly all still in that flat plane and orbits the same direction as the motion of the original cloud. That is incredible! I am pleased that we are made out of the sun's leftovers. Yep, after you've finished a big project, there's nothing wrong with having a bunch of stuff left over. Like how I had a bunch of stuff left over after hanging these lights. One minute to the triangle segment. You sound very confident about all of this science you are saying. That's because we learned it thanks to the process of how we do science. Human, explain this process. It's the process of making observations about something, asking questions, and ultimately taking the best guess about what you think is going on. What we call a hypothesis. This hypothesis has to be something that is testable and can be refined as you gather more data. And most importantly, you need to get other people to try reproducing your observations and testing your hypothesis. These can either help show that your guess makes sense or show that it was wrong. 
The more people who can reproduce your results, the more confidence you can have in what you've found. 30 seconds, people. It sounds like scientists enjoy proving each other wrong. I am often wrong. Does that make me a scientist? Maybe. You don't need a certain college degree to be called a scientist. If you're doing experiments using scientific methods, even at home, then you're basically a scientist. So keep an eye out for whether something is a proven fact. The Earth is round. An untested hypothesis. I can lift an elephant. Or something that is simply not testable. Periwinkle is the best color. That's a scientific fact. Hmm. You may not be as much of a scientist as I thought, Roombot. Oh, so let's get to that triangle battle. are using a telescope on Earth to observe stellar flares from distant stars. Here come the results. They've measured how bright the star is over a few weeks. But look at that. The star's average brightness actually dimmed a couple of times. Why would the star occasionally get dimmer like this? Hey, maybe a planet is orbiting the star and periodically blocking some of its light. Here they are consulting with some of their colleagues. If they've discovered an orbiting planet, those dips in brightness should repeat in a predictable, consistent pattern. But our astronomers need more data to confirm it's actually an exoplanet. They've decided to bring in more astronomers using space telescopes so they can observe this star for a longer period of time. Months later, this new data shows many consistent repeating dips in the star's brightness. It certainly seems to fit the expected pattern of an orbiting exoplanet. This is a great time to publish the results in a scientific journal. This makes the data public and encourages even more astronomers worldwide to make their own observations. Looks like everyone's getting in on the action. Different telescopes with different capabilities are gaining additional information about the exoplanet. And eventually, astronomers have a detailed explanation consistent with all of the observations. This is one example of the process of science in action. Observation, hypothesis, and testing resulted in the discovery of a new exoplanet. And working with the larger scientific community provided validation and new insight. Well done, astronomers, and congratulations on the new exoplanet! In the future, bees will discover technology left behind by space-going humans. They will use it to build their own tiny spaceships and explore the galaxy as... Space Bees! Give up! We have you surrounded. Sort of. Yes, sort of. <laughs> You're backed up against an asteroid. You have nowhere to go. Unless they just kind of fly to the side. Yes, unless you... Stop giving them ideas. I don't know how we're going to get out of this one, Captain. Computer, reveal our current position. You are next to the outer asteroid belt of the star Epsilon Eridani the same place you were when you asked two minutes ago. I knew it! I need options, bees! We could all close our eyes! We could paint our ship asteroid color! We could just surrender! Thanks, Ensign Normal Bee! But I'm not ready to surrender just yet! Perhaps you could escape by flying through the asteroid belt. We'll be smashed to bits! I've seen those Hollywood movies. We've all seen those movies, but the movies are wrong. Hollywood wrong? I doubt that. Action movies like to show asteroid belts as being extremely densely packed, where asteroids are constantly smashing into each other. But the reality is that in a mature asteroid belt, there would be huge distances between large objects. If you were sitting beside one asteroid, you would have a difficult time seeing your nearest neighbor. And not just because you have your windows closed. Well, how about that? First mate, plot a course through the asteroid field. Aye, aye, Captain. Wait, we weren't done threatening you. Amazing! We're inside the asteroid belt, and I haven't seen any other asteroids yet. Which is typical for asteroid fields. Think about it like this. 
for any two asteroids in here, they're likely either moving closer or further away from each other. If they're moving closer, they're likely to eventually hit and combine into a larger object. And if they're moving away from each other, well, that's how you get all this empty space between asteroids. Oh, so yeah, true. true. Yeah, I totally knew this. Over time, you have an asteroid field with a lot of large asteroids, but also a lot of empty space between them. It's all very unlike what you see in the movies. It seems weird that special effects in movies aren't real. We're approaching the second asteroid. Slow to one-tenth speed. Aye, Captain. Wow. There really is a lot of space between them. Who knew that an asteroid field is more empty field than actual asteroid? <sighs> we finally caught you. Wow, you bees fly fast. Very fast indeed. <laughs> Wait a minute, don't compliment them. Oh yeah, I forgot about the spiders. Sorry spiders, we'll have to talk later. Right now we're behind schedule. To do science! Wait, if we blow you up, that would be doing science. Come back, you can't escape. They can if they use hyper boost. Thanks for the tip. Ah, for crying out loud. Hey, Dronebot, I see we still only have the same viewer calling in. We are trying to find that exoplanet you were talking about. I am unable to see it. Well, your first problem is it's daytime and you're inside a building. Telescopes work better at night. Maybe you should turn out the lights. Why did I not think of that? Even if it was night, you shouldn't expect to see the exoplanet itself. Remember, almost every star in the sky is actually a sun, just like ours, so they're very bright. By contrast, planets are relatively much smaller and dimmer, and they're so close to the star from our perspective that they're hidden in its bright glow. Trying to see an exoplanet is like trying to spot the world's tiniest moth right next to a spotlight shining at you from across the Earth. Well, if all we can see is star glow, how do we know there are exoplanets out there? That's a great question, and it's one I'm about to answer right now. Hi, I'm Felicia Day. I am aware of this. When a telescope captures an image of the night sky, some of those stars are so distant, they are just a few pixels of light. It's impossible to see most of the planets because of the glare from their stars. So, how do we discover and characterize so many exoplanets? Is she talking to us? I am uncertain. The answer is that we watch an area of the sky over time, for days, months, or even years. If a star dims and then returns to its original brightness, it's possible that something has passed in front of it and briefly blocked a small fraction of its light. If this happens again and again, it may be an orbiting planet. In fact, it may be multiple planets. The telescope data could look like a random collection of light dips, but planets tend to orbit in repeating patterns. So if a star is observed long enough, astronomers can isolate the pattern of dips that comes from each individual planet. Once the planets are discovered, their orbit times can reveal where they lie within the system. A planet that completes its orbit quickly must be close to the central star. One that takes longer must be further away. We know this thanks to astronomers like Kepler, who provided a bit of math to determine the actual distance for each planet from its star. And you believe this Kepler human's math was accurate? His laws have been verified by observing the planets in our own solar system so yeah, the scientific method gives us pretty high confidence in applying them to other planetary systems. Planet sizes can also be determined by measuring precisely how much light is blocked when a planet transits across the star. Larger planets will block more of the light than smaller planets. A bit more math can help measure their sizes. With enough observation time and math, astronomers can pretty accurately determine all of this information, each planet's size, distance from its star, and orbit time. Wow! Next segment in 30 seconds. Uh, uh, hang on. Astronomers can basically map out an entire system of planets in a completely different part of the galaxy just by watching a few pixels of light get dimmer and brighter? They never even see the planets themselves? That's right. Astronomers call this transit photometry. 
and it's currently responsible for the discovery of more exoplanets than any other technique. And an exoplanet is a planet outside of our solar system. Yeah, I was listening. It's spelled E-X-O-Planets. Drop the E and it would just be exoplanets, as if they were giving us hugs and kisses. Exoplanets. That's very romantic. Yeah, we're not changing how it's spelled. And now, back to The Social Astronomer, your guide to interpersonal success. When you're at a gathering with people you don't know, talking about names can be a real icebreaker. Hi, I'm The Social Astronomer. I'm Tiffany. Fascinating name, but not as fascinating as an exoplanet name. Really? Yes. An exoplanet name generally includes the name of its star system, followed by a letter. Capital letters are only used for stars, while lowercase letters are used for planets. So if the star in the Wolf 359 system has a couple exoplanets, which it does, they're named Wolf 359b and Wolf 359c in the order they were discovered. I get it. So the first exoplanet discovered in a star system named Cardi would be named Cardi B. Yes, but there's more. Few star systems have nice, easy names like Cardi. Many are named after the telescopes that discovered they had planets, followed by a number for the order they were discovered. For instance, planets were found in star systems named Kepler-1, Kepler-2, Kepler-3. So an exoplanet found around Kepler-4 would be Kepler-4b, the star system plus a letter. Fancy. It sure is. Now sometimes an exoplanet name might include not just the telescope, but coordinates in the sky, the date, catalog number, and more. That's how you get exoplanets named Ogle 2018BLG1269L, lowercase b. Be named like an exoplanet. Who wouldn't? I was discovered by the Quality Control Department in Warehouse 17 yesterday, so my name could be Quality Control Department Yesterday Warehouse 17 B. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. Remember exoplanet naming Hello. conventions, and you'll be the life of the party in no time. That's my name now. Hello. You're welcome. After several hundred years, he's back as a ghost. But Sir Isaac Newton sure loves to boast to his great, 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 Dr. Yvonne. She'll teach him all the science he missed while he was gone. Newton's ghost is filmed in front of an audience made of interstellar gas and dust. You will not believe what I just discovered. You remember how I predicted the existence of exoplanets. Well, these modern astronomers of yours have now actually discovered them around distant stars without even seeing them. I know all about exoplanet discovery, but can you come back later so that Carol doesn't think that I'm talking to myself? Did you say something, Yvonne? Yeah. Hi, Carol. <laughs> I was just saying that I thought that I heard a phone call for you in the hall. Huh. I didn't even realize we still had those hall phones. Well done. It's a shame only you can see me, but that means it falls to you to explain. How can an exoplanet be found without seeing it? Okay, because I know that you won't stop bugging me until I do, I'll explain a few methods before Carol gets back. Using the radial velocity technique, astronomers can look for a wobble in the motion of a star, which can be caused by the gravitational tug of planets orbiting the star. This technique was used to discover a good number of planets and measure their mass. The more massive the planet, the more gravity there is tugging on the star. Ah, uh, yes, gravity, my old nemesis. Did I ever tell you I have a formula about gravity? Only like a million times. <laughs> Another method to find exoplanets is gravitational lensing. The gravity of an object, such as a planet, can act as a lens to affect the brightness of a star behind it. It's tricky to do. But astronomers can look for multiple planets using this technique, including rogue planets floating on their own between the stars. There are planets in the dark spaces between stars? You must tell me more. Oh, save it for another episode. <laughs> These days, most exoplanets are found by transit photometry. This is where we measure the amount of a star's light being blocked by a planet transiting in front of it. More planets have been found using this technique than any other. It only works when the plane of a planetary system is angled just right. But it's resulted in finding thousands of exoplanets over the years. Truly, this is 
Amazing. Yeah. We've been doing this for so long, it's easy to forget how clever we humans have had to be to get here. I shall help you to always remember how amazing it is. Okay, I appreciate that, but I don't really think that we should cover Carol's... You used a Sharpie? You can't always remember if it can be erased. I am amazing. Now, while most exoplanets can be found without seeing them, it is occasionally possible to see the actual exoplanet itself. I thought the glare of stars was too bright. Typically, yes, but astronomers are developing technology to help with that. They're finding ways to block a star's light, which can sometimes reveal planets that would otherwise be hidden in the glare. This currently only works with some of the largest exoplanets out there. A planet needs to be pretty far from its host star. An image itself generally just shows a tiny dot. But we should see more better images like this in the future. I have an image of an exoplanet, everybody! Hi. Remember to always carry an exoplanet image with you, and you'll be the life of the party. And now, a very special segment of the show where I answer questions from you. And by you, I mean the crew who's currently filming me. <laughs> what do we got? Oh, great, James has his hand up. Hi, huge fan. Love your work, love this show. So, what's an exoplanet? I think we covered that pretty extensively at this point. I mean, kind of feeling like maybe you weren't listening, James. <laughs> I was running the sound. So your job was to listen. All right, here's the really quick version. Our sun is a star. It has fewer than a dozen planets orbiting around it, including the Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And also Pluto. Pluto is dead to me. Anyway, our galaxy has hundreds of billions of stars that aren't our sun. And those other stars also have planets orbiting around them. Exoplanet is just the name we use for a planet that formed around one of those other stars. Still a planet, just around a different star. Next question. So how do we find exoplanets? We covered that too. You were here in the studio at the time, okay? Okay, in a nutshell, transit photometry is a technique where a telescope stares at a star over time. If the star dims and brightens in a repeating pattern, we can determine if planets are orbiting in front of the star and blocking some of its light. Over time, we can figure out the number of planets around that star, the planet sizes, and their orbital distances, even though we never actually see the planets themselves. Any questions about something I haven't already explained? Are we gonna need to work overtime again today? You know what? Let me tell you again about exoplanets. We have found thousands of exoplanets across our galaxy. We've counted multiple planets around some stars and can often calculate each one's size, orbit speed, and distance from its host star. But we've done all this in most cases without actually seeing the planets themselves. Current telescopes have limited resolution. So how do astronomers know so much about distant planetary systems when no one can even see them? I'm about to answer my own question. There are billions and billions of distant stars in the night. So are there Earth-sized planets hidden round those specks of light? In the photos we take, we can't make them out at all. Starlight's glaringly bright, the planets dimmer and small. So we're out of luck, right? Not quite, cause astronomers are seeking planets blocking light. Hold on, how exactly do they do this, human? Well, if a planet orbits around a distant star and it moves between the star and our viewing perspective, it might block a tiny bit of the star's light. So we may not be able to see the planet itself, but we can measure the amount of light that gets blocked. It almost sounds like you're saying humans can find exoplanets without actually seeing them. I'm glad you caught up. Now here's how they do it. Some telescopes are used to sit and stare at a range of distant stars over time to see which ones of them change. If one dims over time, it could be planets black and light. They transit past the star in our specific line of sight. 
I, there's still more verse. The amount of starlight blocked is small, less than one percent. And but a planet hunting telescope can capture the event. Winking and blinking, secrets shrinking from our sight. Yes, astronomers are seeking planets blocking light. From observing nothing but a star, we're mapping out where all its planets are. The data dips as it flows, the pattern measurement shows how many planets their size is and where each of them goes. Yes, from observing nothing but a star, we're mapping out where all its planets are. Cause astronomers are seeking planets blocking light, seeking planets. Seeking planets, blocking light, seeking planets, blocking light! It's amazing that astronomers can detect planets passing in front of distant stars, but you haven't really done a good job explaining how they determine the number of planets or what sizes they are. Does it sound like the song's over? So now we've got this data of the brightness over time with an occasional dip below a fairly constant line. Astronomers can find the different patterns that repeat over time the planet count gets accurate and more complete. Got it? Cause there's more. The space between the dips records the orbit time duration, which relates directly to the planet's orbiting location. A shorter orbit time means it's on an inner track, while a longer orbit time means the planet's further back. Now back to the verses. The planet sizes can be learned from how much light is blocked. And the structure of this planet's system's finally unlocked. We found thousands of planets, we're finding more as we speak. From this exoplanet slash star transit photometry technique. Yeah! From observing nothing but a star, we're mapping out where all as it flows, the pattern measurement shows how many planets their size is and where each of them goes. Yeah! From observing nothing but a star, we're mapping out where all its planets are. Cause astronomers are seeking planets blocking light. And all of this exoplanet information can be learned by simply observing a distant point of starlight as it gets dimmer and brighter over time. Well, I feel like I've gotten brighter over time. Okay, but how about you get quieter over time? This is the part called the fade out. Seeking planets, seeking planets blocking light, 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 seeking planets, seeking planets blocking light. And that brings us to the end of the Astrophysics Variety Hour. Today's show was brought to you by the process of science. You shouldn't just claim something is true. You should observe, test, and verify it. Then check it and do it again. When you need evidence to back up your explanation, give science a try. I'm Felicia Day. Good night. And remember, we are all made of interstellar gas and dust 527 times. The final round question is, what type of object is the moon? A, a moon, B, a helium balloon, or C, a ravioli? Ooh, I totally know this one. I choose D. Can we pick more than one answer? The spiders are back! We need to figure out how they keep tracking us! Maybe they have a spy on board. Maybe spiders are just as clever as they are handsome. You may be right, Ensign Normal B. You may be right. Which is ultimately why objects go down instead of up. I know, and I just please have some quiet time so I can finish this before my deadline. Of course, I can certainly appreciate the gravity of your situation. <laughs> Did I even tell you about my Apple store? Oh, for the love of Sir Isaac Newton is back as a ghost.